So, allegedly, there's a bug in my code where you know, Gandhi is, is kind of set up to have a very low uh, aggressiveness rating. If something happens in the game to kind of reduce that a little bit, it wraps around to become like the largest integer number where he becomes very aggressive and kind of leads to this nuclear uh, confrontation. It's possible that I put a bug in there, uh, but it was not intentional. Hi, I'm Sid Meier, the creator of Civilization. This is how we built a game that makes you want to take just one more turn. Microprose actually kind of started as a flight simulator company. And uh, after a while, I kind of felt we had exhausted that genre and wanted to try new things. Uh, so we, we did, uh, we made Pirates, we made Covert Action, Railroad Tycoon, and then eventually uh, Civilization. Civilization actually evolved out of a couple of projects that we had done previously. Uh, Railroad Tycoon, I think, is probably the primary one that kind of was our first uh, so-called God game, a game which was more about building than it was about blowing things up. And I remember Bruce Shelley and I were on a train ride to New York for some event, and we said, you know, well, that was fun. That was a fun game. What should we do next? And it was like, well, what's bigger? What's more epic? What's cooler than, than railroads? How about the story of all of civilization? Civilization is a game that allows you to experience uh, 6,000 years of history, starting very small with the a, with a first city. You control a civilization. You explore the world. You interact with uh, other leaders. You develop technology to expand the things that you can do you engage in uh, military operations. It sounds very complicated, but everything is done in a very understandable way, and it, and it starts small and kind of layers on these, uh, these additional elements as the game progresses, so you feel kind of in control. The idea for, for a tech tree, uh, which I think was uh, unique and original to Civilization, came from a book that I was looking at. This one had kind of a timeline of history in it where it would lay out different political advancements or social policies or military things. And I would get, I went kind of with my, you know, my yellow marker, went through that book and said, okay, bronze working is here, iron working, you know, gunpowder. Uh, that almost became the template for uh, the tech tree. And it just felt like a very easy to understand mechanism for showing the player um, how things are connected, giving them kind of an insight into the future giving them goals and things to, uh, to look forward to, you know, two, two steps down the tech tree, I can get to this. Uh, and it felt like uh, just something to very much hang the structure of the game on, that's something that would start simple and again grow and grow and grow as you got further and further into the game. Every game is different. Every game is your unique story about how you guided your civilization from uh, antiquity into the space age. So we have this phrase, which, which is the valley of despair, that every project seems to go through this, this, this valley of despair, like halfway through, you know, this game is not fun, nobody likes it, I can't figure out how to make this work, it's not working, nobody likes me, I don't know, nobody will talk to me, this is terrible. Civ went through that in the kind of transition between the, the real-time version and the turn-based version. So our first approach to this grand topic of civilization was inspired a lot by, by SimCity, the idea of zoning and part of your map to build a new city, maybe creating a zone over here for farmers, um, and having everything happen in a kind of a real-time process where you watched it gradually grow, and now you're ready to zone this, maybe you want to zone this area for mining, and you kind of do these things in the, in the first prototypes that we created. You do these things and kind of sit back and watch it kind of happen and that was that was kind of okay but it really didn't it didn't engage you uh, as much as we really felt the game the game needed to so we actually put that prototype away for a while and we completed another game which was covert action which I'd started and also put away but I think I think actually Bill Staley our, our president was part of that he said Sid you need to finish that <laughs> covert action game which was probably a good thing because that that kind of took us away from the the real-time zone-based version of Civilization. The, the conceit behind that game was creating an interactive story. The idea of creating a story, but that 
was going to turn out differently each time, and it was kind of controlled by the player. You know, interactive literature, an interactive spy story. And uh, what we derived from covert action was what we call the covert action rule, which was a, a failing we thought of the game, was that these action sequences were, were kind of intense and immersive enough that by the time you finished them, you had kind of forgotten, you'd lost the thread of the plot. You know, what was, what was going to happen and what was I trying to prevent or when is that going to... So it was almost like, you know, two, two good games uh, in one package actually kind of conflict with each other. So it's interesting to think what would have happened if, if Civ had never become a turn-based game, if it had stayed uh, or a, a real-time game. I think a good uh, example of that is, is, is Age of Empires. Um, at, at the time, we could have never had that many units running around on the screen, and you know, had, we didn't have the technology to make an Age of Empires. Uh, had we had that technology, maybe we would have gone in that direction. But it's interesting to just compare Age of Empires with, with Civilization. I mean, Age of Empires focuses on a smaller area. The individual decisions are more minute. Uh, in, so in order to keep the complexity under control, it focuses on a, a, a shorter period of time and a smaller area of, of the world, of the map. Um, I think those are, those are smart decisions. I think there's a certain amount of complexity that the player can, can kind of enjoy, and there's a larger amount that becomes work. So I think that um, trying to do a real-time version of Civ that tried to cover the expanse of what the, the, the turn-based game does would, would just be uh, completely overwhelming. I think the, the turning point for Civ was when we switched from real-time to turn-based, and that really only happened because I, I finished another game in, in the interim. I put the real-time version on the shelf, finished Covert Action, and kind of came back to it with, uh, with, with kind of fresh eyes and uh, had this idea about, about you know, making it turn-based, making it, uh, giving a lot of different things to do, control individual units, et cetera, and that was what really made the difference in the game. Probably what, what uh, triggered that in my mind was having played a game uh, called Empire, which had the, 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 the characteristics of uh, unveiling, uh, exploring a map, and had individual units uh, moving around. And I kind of remember that, uh, those aha moments of, uh, you know, another unit, enemy unit showing up, and you say, oh, they're over there. Now I see how that's, this is going to work. Or the kind of uh, I immersion that moving individual units gave you. Uh, I realized that, that was something was missing from our original prototype, and, and we, we slammed it in there, and all of a sudden magic started to happen. Civilization is, uh, is now known for the one more turn phenomenon. And I, I would love to say that we, uh, you know, on day one we said, this has got to have one more turn. Uh, we actually didn't realize there was such a thing as one more turn until really the game w was out there and we started getting feedback from, from players. And we would get these letters like, uh, you know, I, I couldn't stop playing. I, I looked up at the clock and it was three o'clock in the morning. So we said, well, we, we got to figure out what's going on here because this is, this is unique. This is, this is cool. How do, we, how do we make sure that we keep this? And uh, so we, we, we kind of analyzed what was happening. And it was this idea of the game giving you short-term and, and medium-term and long-term goals that were all... Uh, kind of in your mind at one time, and you, you, you might inc you might uh, complete a short-term goal, but bang, another short-term goal popped up, and you're still working on this medium-term goal. And um, there was never a time in the game where you were kind of had had completed everything that you wanted to do. You're always uh, looking forward to um, you know when I get that new technology, I can do this. When I explore that new continent, this is going to happen. So there's always these things that you're looking forward to. The game is actually playing playing out in your mind, anticipating what's happening. You're not you're almost not playing at the moment. You're playing into the future, and that future is just one more turn uh, ahead. So it, we've created this phenomenon that uh, we really didn't uh, anticipate, but we're now proud to acclaim. So my advice, if you find yourself in the in the Valley of Despair, is to try something new and different. We have another rule, which is the double it or cut it in half rule, which is if you're going to make a change, make it dramatic. If, if the number is wrong, you know, don't add 10 percent or take away 3 percent, you know, double it or cut it in half, you know, so that if you try a lot of kind of dramatic changes, something is going to stick, something's going to work, and it's going to show you a new direction, and you can 
climb out of the, of the valley of despair. When the 25th anniversary of civilization rolled around, uh, I realized we had in our basement some of the original computers that were used to create the game. I thought it would be fun to try to resurrect those. There were actually two of these compact Death Pro 386 computers uh, that I'd saved for all those years, and we brought them in here and tried to fire them up. Uh, one of them uh, actually exploded when we plugged it in. There was a bunch of dust around the power supply that caught fire, and the fan blew flames out the back of it, so we shut that one down. Uh, but we were able to fire this computer up. Uh, the only problem was the battery had died, and we couldn't boot it because the, the, there was no power. We finally managed to do that by finding a floppy disk, but now we can't turn the machine off because we won't be able to turn it back on again. So it's been running here for, for over a year. But this is the computer uh, that the majority of Civ development was, was done on. And uh, it's running the, uh, the fabulous DOS uh, operating system here. Uh, so I'm going to go into the directory, which is called Civilize, and run this uh, early version of the game. Here are the options. Here's, this is where it starts. Start a new game, uh, <clears throat> Earth, play on the Earth. This is the beginning of, uh, of Civilization here. So we'll start a new game. An early version of our intro sequence. This is really uh, something we did to make this game feel epic. Uh, these are all kind of temporary graphics that I did with, uh, with D-Paint and uh, finally hired a real artist to uh, eventually replace these. And to me, this is the classic civilization visual, that, that first settler, the tiny little bit of the world revealed and the, and the rest of the world to explore. Basically, anything can happen from this point on. Uh, you know, where do you place your city? What's going to happen next? It's all uh, ready to unfold in the epic saga of civilization. <laughs>